we got everybody in here that wants to be. Sean's going to get the attendance. All right, good day. Um, all right, so just a couple of things. Talking about the season's almost almost going to be over before we know it here. Just remember that, we, of course, we have playoffs coming up. Um, and that includes, of course, veteran officials, but also new officials that there could be opportunities to work chains and things like that. So uh, don't check out on us just yet, okay? And I can I can tell you this from experience in my first years is that your district director will highly appreciate it if you are available to do things like chains and clocks throughout the playoffs. They really, really appreciate that. And they, they will remember it later on, so. All right, um, talk a few communication things here just for a second. Uh, one that we saw on film, one that we saw last night watching JSU play. Um, just always remember the clock status, communicate clock status, every play, okay? Every play, do not rely on the referee to have the clock status, okay? They should know the clock status, but they might not. They might need a reminder. They have a lot on their minds. Okay, when they're enforcing a penalty and signaling press box and those things. So help them remember the clock status. Uh, the clock operator needs to know the clock status. Everybody on the field needs to know the clock status. So communicate that, especially when you get late in a half. When you get under two minutes and a half, there are some options for the offended team, or actually one option for the offended team. They can they can put the clock on the snap when it by rule should be on the ready. The offended team can put it on the snap under two minutes and a half. So remind each other of that. It would be good if somebody, and this could be the clock operator, just keyed the mic real fast and announced when there was two minutes left in the half, just so everybody realizes it and can be thinking about that. All right, everybody should know the down, the line of scrimmage, the hash mark, and the line to gain on every play. All right, everybody should be re re reciting that to yourself, either out loud or to in your head on each play. Down, line of scrimmage, hash mark, line to gain. Okay, we need to know that every play. When we have a foul, we need to get on the radio and we have to communicate to each other what we have. We witnessed last night in a college game with a Division I officiating crew who did an excellent job, did not communicate a foul. A deep wing had a flag for a hold. Flag was in the wrong place. Didn't hit. It didn't make it to where the foul occurred. Apparently, he didn't move it. I know he didn't move it because I saw him not move it. And apparently, he didn't communicate that the foul occurred before the pass was caught. There was a lot of things that were not told. So the rest of the crew, in, in the effort to be quick about things, um, marked a penalty off from, from what they thought was a spot. So the correct timing of the foul. So they ended up having to re-measure the enforcement and also change the hash mark. They ended up going from spot of the foul to previous spot and it was ended up being half the distance and they just, it didn't look good, you know, it didn't look good. And it was simply a matter of if who threw the flag, I mean, get on the radio and just tell what you have, all right? And I have a hold is not enough, okay? That part everybody already knew. When did you have a hold? Where did you have a hold? That's, and who did you have it on, obviously. But all those things are important, okay? So that the rest of the crew and everybody who's responsible for getting that marked off can get it done. And the rest of the crew can verify that they did it correctly. Nobody can verify something that they don't know what's going on. All right, when you have your pregame meeting, referees and umpires, please remember, please remember to remind them about sharing the film, okay? Please tell them, please tell them, do not push the quarterback through the line on a quarterback sneak. This is week eight, okay? We've called it twice. It's happened, I don't know, a dozen or more times, okay? So please tell them not to do it. And then when they do it, please flag it. Please, if we don't accomplish anything by the end of this season, all of our contract schools should remove that play from their playbook. Okay? We owe it to them. They're going to get somewhere else, or they're going to get in the playoffs, and somebody's going to call it on them. 
and they're going to give them that line of well, nobody's told us we couldn't do that all year long and they maybe they're correct on that okay and that's going to be on us all right we owe it to them to let them know what the rules are and to enforce the rules throughout the year so they don't run into this playoff mess of things all of a sudden seem different to them okay that's that consistency that coaches complain about all the time so please 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 tell the coach before the game do not push the quarterback through the line and then when they do it anyway flag it the very first time they do it flag it okay also remind the coaches about sideline behavior okay just remind them that we're under direction to or we have full support of montgomery however you want to word it to them word it as nicely as you can we're not going to pick a fight okay but just remind them in a very nice and professional way that their behavior is uh, expected to be good throughout the game and if they need to vent a little bit or if they have questions for us they the head coach needs to do so from the team box he does not need to step on the field to do that if you would like to nominate somebody for president who is currently rusty burroughs vice president who is currently myself a signer who is currently cecil garrison or sean crawford's board position if you would like to nominate somebody for any of those positions please let robert howell know he will collect those nominations and we will vote at our last meeting of the year which will be the week of round one and it will be a face-to-face -face meeting at the high school the actual date is yet to be determined probably wednesday most likely okay all right uh long sleeve shirts okay sean crawford who is the him and robert howe are the last people to break out a long sleeve shirt sean crawford his long sleeve shirt is hanging on the wall behind him currently if you look at a picture of him on the screen okay if sean crawford can go find his long sleeve shirt and break it out before december then so can the rest of us all right so this is a long sleeve weekend all right let's get out some long sleeve shirts if you do not have a long sleeve shirt you've got to acquire one these are not when the when the white hat decides that you're wearing long sleeves it is not optional and we cannot go on the field on a friday on a varsity game without matching shirts we can sort of get away with things maybe on a junior high game you know somebody got a black undershirt black long sleeve undershirt or whatever nobody's gonna say anything but a friday night game that is 100 percent off the table you have to have on matching shirts and when white hat says you're wearing long sleeve you're wearing long sleeve so if you if you don't have one let's get one borrow one something okay because this is a long sleeve weekend and it may be for the rest of the year okay i look don't know what the weather will be but we'll have some cold nights uh jackets are fine for warm-ups uh jackets cannot be worn during the game unless you want to change the clock Chains and clock can wear black jackets um Hill crew, if it was really, really cold out, and it's not going to be that kind of cold this week. But if we have a game later on where it's really cold, uh, you can wear jackets during warm-ups. As long as everybody has on a jacket and it's the AHSA black jacket that we're supposed to have. But if one person wears a jacket during warm-ups, everybody wears a jacket during warm-ups. All right, the time is ticking for the classification exam. I think everybody's probably, most everybody's taking it. There's a few people though, uh, several people who have taken it who have not made a hundred. Uh, there's no reason not to go back and retake it in, until you make a hundred. Uh, I spent a lot of my time today taking basketball tests over and over again until I made a hundred. So y'all can take football tests over and over again until y'all make a hundred. <laughs> I finally, Finally figured out what uh, what it takes to be in the front court instead of the back court. That was the hold up. Took me about three rounds. I, I think I went through every choice on the question, but I finally got it right and made a hundred. So, um, but no, everybody want to make a hundred on that. If you have a uh, playoff and especially deep playoff and and absolutely, if you have super seven aspirations, you have to make a ninety. Okay, an eighty nine or eighty eight won't cut it. You have to make a ninety. So you need to check and make sure and i if i was looking for a super seven official i would expect him to make a hundred because you can take it as many times as you need to take it until you get them all right and i would not be looking for somebody who just took a test and realized they missed five questions and just moved on like it wasn't no big deal okay so make a hundred david bell said a 90 i would recommend a hundred 
Uh, I said you can take it as many times as you want to. It closes on the 29th. All right, anybody got any questions, comments, problems before we turn the film on? All right, here we go. Just a minute here. Not too many clips tonight. Um, same thing as I told you last week. At this point in the season, I think we're I think we've watched enough holding and pass interference. I'm leaving it up to y'all now to to go through the 10, 15, 25, 30 holding clips that we may have in any given week. Um, please watch them. Please, please, please watch them. If you if you would like to be um, proficient at calling those things, there's only one way to do it, and that's watch it on the tape. Same thing with pass interference, of which we didn't have hardly any of that this week. We had a lot of running games this week. So, All right, let's start off with a few mechanical things, or maybe one mechanical thing. Uh, not, not ever picking on deep wings. We say this all the time. We talk about deep wings all the time. I, I know I always say this. Really two reasons, I guess. One is that we take pride in being a, a, a predominantly seven-person association, but also because a lot of our new officials work deep. That's kind of where they get broken in to varsity games, and um, we want to correct We want to correct what you're doing and get you right, okay, get you trained up so you can advance and, and uh, go further, all right? So here's a just an example and a reminder that the deep wing should never pass the goal line. We stay on the goal line. The deep wing never passes the goal line. We need to be on the goal line right there. And then at this particular case, we back up here, not just on the goal line, but this was a play as another good example of why we should be. This is spring garden. You need to be standing on the fence right here. Okay. I know how far that is at spring garden. That's about the right distance. If you were standing on that fence right there, you'd be just about the right distance out of bounds. Okay, and if you're standing there out of bounds on the goal line, when this play hits in front of you, you never have to move your feet and your eyes can simply just focus on what's going on, catch, no catch, DPI, whatever it could be, touchdown, no touchdown, whatever's going to happen, and never have to move your feet. Okay, and then just a side note here, never give incomplete and kill the clock. Okay, just incomplete, stop right there, don't kill the clocks. The rest of the crew will kill the clock. If the if the um, end clock operator is paying attention, then I mean the ball bounced off the ground, the clock order stop. All right, um, let's talk about advantage disadvantage. We're going to use an example here of an illegal shift, okay? About when things might be technically a foul, okay? And if we want to get letter of the law and down right in the rule book, then this is you know probably not set for account. But it doesn't say one second. Everybody always interprets a count as one second, okay? And I don't, you know, my one second and your one second may be different, but I know our my count, I may count faster than other people. And when I'm working short wing or any or referee either one, I tend to count really quick. In other words, if they are motionless, if they are still when the ball snap, I ain't got anything, okay? We're not going to do this this one second thing is that's, that's just cutting it too close or, or being too rigorous on the rules. So if if they're in the case of the tight end right here, their hands going down, if his hand hits the ground and is stationary before the snap, prior to the snap, and he's set, okay, we can warn them, we can talk to them, we can tell them, hey, that's close. All right. If we watch this right here, this tight end on the bottom of the screen, it's bam, bam, let that go. Okay. If you want to talk to him, you can, all right? But let's let that go. All right, and back to the reason we want to just use this as an example of advantage, disadvantage, okay? They're not, if they are not moving at the snap, then they are not gaining an advantage. If his hand is down and he is set in a stance prior to the snap, then the defense should be aware that the snap could be coming at any instant. All right, nobody's being caught off guard by that movement. Nothing like no advantage is being gained, so we don't need to penalize them. We can talk to them. We can warn them. If it's persistently this close, that might be different. Uh, this is the 20th play of the game, so it's not early enough to have been a problem yet. So let's just 
talk to, talk to, talk to. Okay. So we don't we don't have to have a flag on any, anything like that. It doesn't have to be just this not picking on just this play, just an example of advantage, disadvantage. If it's not gaining an advantage, we don't need a flag. All right. That's again very different from safety fouls. Safety fouls are different. Okay. But advantage, disadvantage, there needs to be a clear advantage for one team or a clear disadvantage for the other team before we foul it, flag it and penalize them. This is an illegal shift, okay? So this right here, this is this is moving all over the place, and he's still moving and shifting when the ball snapped, okay? So that is an illegal shift that we need to get that one. And I think probably what's happening here is he's not lined up right, and we're trying to get him lined up, okay? At the junior high level, I can let that go, okay? At the varsity level, they need to know how to line up. So at this case right here, this kid's got two choices. Well, maybe three. He can stay where he's at, and we'll have an illegal formation. He can move up too late before the ball snapped, and he can have an illegal shift. Or he could hurry up and or have his, his quarterback could pay attention and make sure all his players are lined up before they snap it. But either way, he's got to get himself up there and get set. He's not set. Okay, so this is either going to be – if he's not going to hurry up and get lined up, he's either going to have an illegal formation or an illegal shift. It's going to be one or the other, okay, because he is not getting himself out here and getting lined up. And it's a little bit on his quarterback, too, for not giving him a second to get lined up. One more illegal shift. Motion can't start before everybody goes down. Now, this does deceive the defense. If you start motion and then a hand goes down – that can be confusing as, as to whether this guy is in motion or if he's shifting and they're going to stop before they snap it. And you can sneak up on people if you've got multiple people moving at one time. All right. So there can be an advantage gained by the offense and the defense can be put at a disadvantage when two people are moving at a time. So you see he starts in motion and the several linemen go down, especially the right tackle. You can see him pretty clear. So he's he's in motion. And then the right tackle goes down. If I'm playing defense right here, I'm not thinking they're going to snap it at that point. Okay? So that's an advantage gained by the offense, and defense put it at a disadvantage. So this is a good call for an illegal shift. Very good job. All right. Just a, something we haven't seen in a while here, just a little unnecessary roughness, and just a reminder that you can tackle people in just about any way you want to. Uh, you cannot grab them by the face mask, and you cannot horse collar tackle them, and you cannot trip them with your leg, okay? And But anytime you stop their forward progress, you've got to start easing up. And this is an example of that not happening, okay? So right there, right there, that player's forward progress is stopped. Don't have a problem with him getting him on the ground. If he wants to get him on the ground, that's understandable. This is a football game. But flipping him over backwards, WWE, belly to belly, belly to back suplex, or whatever that would be, um, that's not acceptable. Okay. So this was correctly called for a personal foul for unnecessary roughness because his forward progress has stopped. If they're spinning and going down the field and he ends up flipping him forward, probably nothing. Okay. Probably nothing if he throws him forward. All right. Um, but the fact he's throwing him backwards by just physics of it, if he's going, if he's throwing him backwards, then his forward progress was stopped, and therefore this is unnecessary roughness. And whistles don't have anything to do with it. Okay, um, the play is dead when his forward progress stops, and players are supposed to know that. Right here, progress stop, plays dead. After that, we've got to start easing up, and that's not easing up. Okay, and it looked like we'd come off the top rope or something here with a couple of teammates. I mean, this is. This is rough. So good job getting that one. All right, in this particular play, the actually the R, this is the return team on fourth down or punting situation. They've got 12 in a formation. Just as a reminder that if they have 12 in a formation and nobody's trying to get off, that's a foul and a timeout does not save it. Okay. So he had they had 12 in a formation before anybody called timeout, if that's true, and it has to be true because there's 12 on the field. So if there's 12 on the field and nobody's running off, timeout doesn't save it. If somebody's trying to get off and they want to call timeout before the snap, then that's then that saves saves them from the foul. If you have this situation, 
flag it, and he says timeout, just let him know that, Coach, we're still going to have illegal substitution because you had 12 in the formation. If you want your timeout back, you can have it. Okay, that's the courteous thing to do there because you, you know he's trying to call timeout for a particular reason. If he still wants the timeout, he can have it. But this is one case, and there's not very many, and maybe the only case, where it is the reasonable thing to do to offer him back the timeout. All right. Anytime we have a change of possession, okay, we have to we have to really really work on this. This is tough, okay. These are tough plays. Change of possession is it's very difficult to keep our eye discipline. All right, but we've got to keep our eye discipline on all plays. All right, especially on a change of possession because things are going to happen. We're going to have to move our feet a lot. We're going to have to reposition ourselves. Um, in this case, this is a seven-person crew. We have, of course, reverse mechanics and a lot of things going on. All right, but we have to keep our eye disciplined. Okay, so what we're going to see here is a pass that is intercepted right here. And immediately after the interception, we get a very big blindside block. Okay, so what we have to do, first off, we're never watching the football. Okay. The football is not going to do anything interesting down here unless it hits the ground. And if we're watching players, we'll see it hit the ground. Okay, we'll, we'll pick that up. So a high pass like this, we need our eyes down, okay, down on the players. All right, so we're wondering if anybody's getting held or pass interfered with here. Now, there's a lot of space between players, so that's not happening. But as soon as he catches that ball, we got to find lead blockers. We've got to find lead blockers, and that's – Back judge, deep wing, short wing. Everybody's got to pick up what's going on right in front of the runner. This is now the runner, okay? The pass is over. This is now the runner. We're officiating a running play at this point. We're doing it in reverse mechanics, meaning our short wing's got the goal line. Deep wing's got down to the two, but we're doing a running play. So we've got to find the lead blocks like that one right there, okay? So we've got to pick that one up. Needed it, needed three eyes on that, okay? At that moment, that was the only block of interest taking place. All right, once that one was officiated, then we should move to the next one here, about the 10-yard line, all right? We would get three sets of eyes on that one, okay? So we, got, we, we should have probably two or three flags on this and then three sets of eyes down here. All right, and then the short wing's at the goal line, and the deep wing is now focused on forward progress at the five, and we're all good. All right, now, same thing on the backside. Let's talk about backside on this a minute. If this were a regular running play, the referee is taught and knows never to pass players, okay, especially players of opposite color jerseys. So if you get a long run or a long pass, the referee is never going to run past players, especially if they are on opposite teams. You're going to have to stay back there with them, get them up off the ground, and tell them to hustle on down the field, and we'll get there when we get there. Okay, But we're not going to leave them back there behind us. The same thing is true for the back judge in a reverse mechanic situation. The back judge doesn't need to pass players. Okay, At this point, all right, we've got two people of opposite jerseys Two people of opposite jerseys laying behind us, okay? One of them just got himself laid out, okay? There's a reasonable chance that he might decide to retaliate. If had he done so, he doesn't here, but had he retaliated for that right here, nobody would have known it, okay? There's not a person that's going to see that. The only person that can see it or should see it is the back judge. So just remember, keep everybody in front of you. Keep everybody. It's the same thing for short wings, deep wings on a regular play. When you're coming in to spot the ball, don't pass players, all right? Don't pass players. The exception to that is a short wing on a short play. If it's within a yard of a line to gain, then go all the way in, pass all the players you have to pass, and everybody else on the crew needs to be aware that the short wing is passing players and they need to make an account for whoever's left out there on the outside. Okay? There's a lot to learn from this little play right here. All right, speaking of blindside blocks, okay? 
um, slot receivers, especially slot receivers, uh, be aware of the down blocks, okay? Expect them, all right? Especially if you got running a running team, okay? A team that's going to run it 90% of the game. If they if they spread out a little bit, uh, the odds are they're just trying to flank out, outflank people for a running play. They're probably not trying to throw the ball, okay? So he can block down, but he has to do so legally, all right? He cannot – he'll be above the waist, has to be in front. And if the defender cannot see him coming, then it cannot be forcible or he has to use open hands. All right. So we got to be eyes on this. OK, this is a back judge and also short wing, deep wing, because it's deep wings looking at this guy who's not pressed. OK, so probably looking through. They're so close together right there that we're pretty much everybody's kind of looking at both. OK, because they're all it's almost like a bunch formation, really. Yeah. If he is alive. So we ought to have a several sets of eyes on that because this is the first action that's expected to take place. So what we see here is a illegal blindside block. Okay. So just expect it. Another case that you would expect it in, um, probably shouldn't have found an example to stick in here, but if you have a wide receiver who starts in a little short motion back towards the ball pre-snap, expect him to block down hard. OK, so anticipate these hard down blocks and make sure they're legal. All right, I'm just, you know, there it is. If they line up like that, they're going to run a quarterback sneak and they're probably going to push through the line because the Philadelphia Eagles do it. And why not the rest of us? So anyway. All right. Um, Starting to get tired talking about that. OK, uh, here's something we haven't seen in quite a while. I don't think that I remember. This is a kicking team that does not have four, at least four players on each side of the kicker. Uh, appears that this was correctly called, best I can tell. Good job. Um, predominantly, this is the referee's responsibility, but it's not against the rules. If somebody else picks up on it, doesn't really. I mean, it matters, but it doesn't matter too much. Um, but this technically the referee's look, even though it looks kind of strange to call a foul from 60 yards away, but it's an easy one to call from 60 yards. It's just counting. Um, but there's only three guys up here, if you can tell. The kicker is the fourth guy, so there's only three players on the right of the kicker. All right, so at that instant right there, we have a dead ball foul. Okay, so it's a dead ball foul. We're going to shut it down, all right? And we're not going to call it beforehand because somebody else could kick it. This, If this kid right here had kicked it, it would be legal, okay? But the fact that the number three man kicked it makes it illegal. I'm sorry, the number four. If the number three kicked it, it would be illegal also. But if number one, two, three, or four end up kicking the ball, it's going to be illegal. If number five kicks it, it would be fine. So that's a dead ball foul right then. Good job. Oh, let's see what this one is real fast. Okay. First thing is this, and I, I know the mechanics manual says you can move short wings up, okay, but it's highly, highly not recommended, okay? And I know some teams kick short and they kick short all night. Um, I'm not going to worry about that, okay, because especially in a seven-person crew, I'm going to tell you two things to think about. In a seven-person crew, you got four people up here on the restraining lines. That's enough, okay? That's all you need. If, you do, if your short wings are back on the goal line and 40 yards from the ball, then no big deal, okay? It's not, it's not a big deal. If you're in a five-person crew and a team is onside kicking all the time, we did this in junior high the other night. We had a full live junior high game, and both teams were just kicking onside kicks. We realized that after about the second or third one, and we just went in the onside kick formation the rest of the game. And if you're at uh, – some school that's doing that, I'm thinking Randolph County right off the top of my head, who picks a lot of short squibs and onside kick. Uh, just go with a um, – if you're in a five-person, just just go with the um, onside formation. Put both short wings up on the restraining lines for the whole game. That's the best place to be. That's something to officiate. Standing on the 20 is nothing to officiate standing on the 20. You're just standing in the middle of everything, Okay. If the ball gets kicked behind you, then you're you're not seeing any, you're not seeing the ball. You can't look at the ball and the wind the clock and see the blocks. No, there's no way you can't. Your eyes won't split in two different directions. 
So the 20 yard line is a real no man's land on a kickoff. And we used to stand there for years and it was not good. And we finally fixed it and moved everybody back. And uh, my advice, even though the mechanics manual says that you can move them up and that's fine. My advice is don't do it. Okay. Just keep them on the back line, keep them on the goal line and it's not going to kill them to trot forward just a little bit. Also, we got to remember the engagement zone. We got to track our players down the field. Okay. Seven person crew shouldn't be a problem. Everybody's accounted for by somebody on the front line, but we got to keep track of folks and we've got to make sure that we're letting the short wings and the referee take care of the lead blocks in front of the ball carrier. Okay. The deep, the back four, back judge, umpire, side judge, field judge. Um, they have this area here, this engagement zone in here. Not worried about the ball, not worried about the lead blocks. All right. We've got three other officials who are going to handle the lead blocks and afford progress. So let's keep our eyes back here so we don't miss that little chop right there, a little cut block right there. Okay. It's a long way from the ball. So, you know, if everybody's ball watching, we're going to miss it. Okay, so let's let's keep eye on who we look who we're supposed to be looking at. Okay, these are a couple of clips from many miles away that were just sent to us just to get some opinions on some things, and I thought they were good ones. We've got three more clips here, and these are all from uh, another district and life far, far away. So this is none of us. Just interesting plays and some things we haven't seen in a few weeks. Um, this one, I think we're going to get a better view. Let me roll this forward. I think it's got a – give me just a second and see if I've got a – yeah, this one goes in a little tighter. Okay. So what what we're going to see here is an onside kick, and this, this film for some reason doesn't like to rewind. Anyway, we're going to see an onside kick. Uh, it's a pooch kick. It's not a pop-up kick. We're going to see a pop-up kick in just a minute. Um in fact, I may have it out of order, or did I? Okay, anyway, we'll see a pop-up kick in a second. This is a pooch kick. He pooches it straight up in the air. All right, it goes 10 yards, okay? And you're going to have to apologize for the reverse part. It won't back up for me. But what's happening is it goes 10 yards. It's still in the air, but we just take out the return man. Okay, so the returner just gets taken out right there, okay? So that's kick catch interference. All right. And then it looks like we also have a kick out of bounds. I can't really tell for sure from here. But it looks like it goes out of bounds, untouched by the return team. So we actually have we'd have two fouls. Um probably going to enforce the kick catch interference one. Okay, that would be the logical one in most circumstances. They can't have both. Okay. R gets to choose between kick catch interference and free kick out of bounds. But that's kick catch interference. Because the ball has gone 10 yards, but it has not touched the ground. It's got to do both, okay, before we can start taking people out and trying to cover it. So the kicking team's got to let it go 10 and touch the ground, trying to catch it in the air. It's kick-catch interference, even if there's nobody from the return team around it, and even if they don't even want to catch it, it doesn't matter, okay? The kicking team has to let it hit the ground, and we can't just take out the returner like that. So that's kick-catch interference. If K touches the ball right here, let's talk about that for a second. If K touches the ball in this case, it's gone more than 10 yards. So there is no bean bag because it's not first touching of the kick because it's gone 10 yards and the clock should start. So the clock should start even if it's touched by K because it's gone more than 10 yards. So we should have a, a wind of the clock and a flag. No bean bags. Okay. No bean bags, just a wind of the clock, throw a flag. When the ball bounces itself out of bounds, then we kill the clock and throw another flag. It's going to be a busy play, okay? It's going to be a busy play. What we need to do on this, uh, Todd's talked about this before, is if you are the side the ball is coming to, then you need to officiate the ball. Did it go 10 yards or not? Did somebody touch it or not? Did K touch it? Did R touch it? Where did they touch it? Did it go out of bounds or not? Officiate the ball. And if you're opposite of where the ball went, uh, officiate the blocks. Did they block before it went 10 yards? Is it KCI? Anybody can call this KCI, though. This was not, I mean, this is not something that really should have snuck up on anybody. That's a pretty blatant one. So, but 
If you break it into two parts like that, I think that helps us. Here's a pop-up kick, and then we're going to see another. I got my clips a little out of order, but that's all right. Here's a pop-up kick. I haven't seen one of these in a few weeks. This is kind of a weak pop-up kick, but it is a pop-up kick. If you watch it, he drives it. It's a little hard to see, but he drives it straight in the ground. Let's see if I can get it to go to a tighter view. Yeah, not much. Anyway, it's a pretty distant film, but he kicks a little pooch, a little pop-up. Back the thing back up here. So he drives it straight in the ground and it pops up well overhead high. Okay. So our general, the book doesn't describe how high it has to go to be a pop up kick. It just says you can't drive the ball straight in the ground and make it bounce up. So how high is it? We've always said it's from a philosophical view is that if it, if it would require the returner to look up, if he's got to look up to catch it, that's a pop up kick because that's putting him at a safety disadvantage the fact that his eyes have to go up high and he's not going to see contact coming so this is certainly high enough for that it's a little when i say it's a little weak as it comes up pretty short but it's still high so this should be a pop-up kick it should be flagged and dead ball we should be killing it killing it as hard and fast as we can trying to avoid contact okay if we can we want to get it shut down before people make contact with each other interesting enough here just as odd little play is this doesn't get called so this is left to go live here and the offended team ends up snatching the ball here and taking off and they things where the fouling team probably wishes they had called it because the other team the r would not have the ball inside the 10. just be aware of those okay be very very aware of those Here's another little kick catch interference from a high view. Okay. So we're kicking off from the 45 here. So apparently we had, there was something that moved the ball. I don't know what. Um, but this is a legal kick, but this is not legal to jump in front of him like that, even if it's because it's because it has not touched the ground. Okay, that's what I'm trying to say. It has not touched the ground. All right. So you can see this furthest it would be number one. As far as the way we number the kicking team players, this is player number one out here. If we watch him, it's gone 10 yards and he may leaps and snatches it. Okay, that's kick catch interference, even though he didn't touch anybody. So the previous kick catch interference was they blew up the returner. Most people get that one. Okay, this one, there's no contact. He just jumps in front of him and catches it. That would be fine had it touched the ground, but in this case, it had not touched the ground. So it's kick catch interference okay had he drove it in the ground and made it pop up this high then it should have been a pop-up kick but this was just a pooch kick and he catches it in front of the receiver like that before it hits the ground doesn't matter if the receiver's even there they want to kick okay if they had no players over there to catch it he still can't catch it or touch it until it hits the ground or it's kick catch interference again gone 10 yards so we need no bean bang we need to wind the clock throw a flag, and kill the clock when the play's dead. Okay? All right. Maybe the shortest meeting of the year, unless y'all want to talk about something, which I'll stay here as long as you want to. Um, did I unshare my screen? Are y'all looking at me again now? Is it off? Okay. Anybody got anything? Anything we want to talk about? Thanks. Please will say we're wearing short sleeves this week. Well, that's up to your white hat. That's up to your white hat. And uh, if you're on my crew, y'all just go ahead and iron your long sleeve shirts. I see Sean, my umpire's already got his out, hanging up, ready to go. 61 degrees at 9 o'clock. How much? 61 degrees at 9 o'clock. Right. Y'all sweat all you want. We're going to sweat. We're wearing short sleeves. Y'all go for it. We're going to sweat. Each their own. That's it. That's it. No problem. Hey David. Yep. What the what we talked about last night on David's quiz? I thought that was a, about the uh, field goal. It can carry over in the overtime. Yeah, let's talk about that. That's good. Let's talk about the state quiz. Let's mention this too because this is this is one that you wouldn't know from the rule book. Let's talk about before we talk about that. Uh, I think it was the first question on the quiz. I don't remember, but it was about um, 
points for region tiebreakers. So we're in the time of year, obviously, where it's we're the we're in region. Everything matters for playoffs and who wins and loses. And you could have a game that, that the two teams play in may not have anything to do with may not be in the playoffs, but who wins or loses that game can affect somebody else going to the playoffs. All right. So at this point of the year, most games have some kind of either direct or indirect playoff implications. All right. So the question from the quiz had to do with a touchdown was scored late that did not was not going to change the outcome of the game. So the team who was trailing scored late. The team who was in the lead could score late. It doesn't matter. But if the touchdown that scored with no time on the clock is the, if the try is not going to tie or win the game, then we don't attempt it. The game is over. The rule book says that you can kick that kick or have that try if points are part of a tiebreaker system. In Alabama, the point points have no bearing on tiebreakers for region standing. I had that in a, in a game a few years ago. The coach asked that. I told him no. Wasn't real sure, honestly, in the moment. Just didn't feel right. So I told him no, and we said the game was over. Went straight home, looked it up. Sure enough, if you go under the – you can't find that in a rule book. You'll have to go to the HSA football manual, like what the coaches read. And if you dig down through there, you'll find the tiebreakers. And if you read through them, there is nothing in there about points. It's just wins and losses and opponents' wins and losses and all the way down to a coin toss. But there's nothing in there about points. So when the clock goes to zero and the game is decided, then off we go. Obviously, if the try would make a difference in the winner or loser, then obviously you play the try. All right, the other two other questions on there. One, they had a field goal with no time remaining. The field goal tied the game, and they had a foul on R. I think specifically it was roughing the kicker. So since that was on a field goal, that foul would be enforced on the first play of overtime. Okay, we'll come back to that here in just a second. We'll talk about overtime procedures here in just a second. The other scenario they had was um, a touchdown was scored and there was a foul on the defense on B. And I don't remember what the score was, but either way, it was the, the, the um, clock had went to zero. It was the last play of the fourth quarter. That foul has to be administered on – that penalty has to be administered on the try. You cannot take that penalty to overtime. Okay, so touchdowns, if you read the rule book, touchdowns, fouls by the defense on a touchdown play can be bridged to the try or the kickoff. There is no kickoff for overtime. So if the next play is going to be overtime, then the try has to be where that penalty is enforced. Let's go back to um, – Let's go back to the whole overtime administration process, okay? When we reach overtime, the first thing we're going to do is take a three-minute break, okay? So we're going to put – best to put three minutes on the clock so everybody's aware of what we're doing. Put three minutes on the clock, turn it on. We're going to have a meeting in the middle. We're going to send both teams to their sidelines. We're going to give them three minutes to get themselves sort of regrouped. We're going to have a meeting in the middle of the field. And we're going to talk about several things as a crew. The first thing is, do we have any carryover penalties? If we do, we have to communicate those to both teams before the coin toss because that could affect how a coach wants to play the coin toss. If, there's going, if we're not going to be starting from the 10-yard line because of a penalty, then the coach is going to, both coaches are going to want to know that because that's going to possibly affect their decisions at the coin toss. We're going to remind ourselves that there are no chains in overtime. We have a box and a box only. So we need to politely ask the chain crew to set the stakes, the down markers, or the line to game markers, sorry, over the fence. The best thing to do is put them off the field. Okay. So that way nobody gets confused at any point and thinks that we should have first down markers on the field. We should have a box. It shows us first down, second down, third down, fourth down, but there are no line to gain equipment in overtime. All right, we need to make sure that the game clock, once that three minutes runs out, just stays on zero. Okay. The play clock, though, will operate. So if we have, we need to stay in the booth, the game clock operator needs to stay in the booth with the play clock operator. Don't leave your partner up there by themselves, but your job is over. 
If you're the game clock operator, when you get to overtime, you're done for the night. But we still have a play clock and we still have a box man. But the rest of the chain crew and the game clock operator's night is over when we get to overtime. The last thing we need to make sure everybody understands before we break out of that little huddle and get the process started is that if if the defense gains possession on a play during overtime, that play is dead. There's not going to be a fumble return for a score in overtime. There's not going to be a pick six returned for a score in overtime. There's not going to be a block kick returned for a score in overtime. Anytime the defense, B or R, gains possession of the ball, the play is dead in overtime. That has to be told to the coaches because I guarantee you every overtime game I've ever been in, at least one of the coaches didn't know that, or at least in the moment didn't remember it, okay? And you don't want to have that conversation after they pick the ball off and you're blowing it dead and the kid runs down there and they think they've scored and won the game. That's not when you want to have that conversation. So remind the coaches of any penalties beforehand and that the ball will be dead if the defense gains possession of the ball, okay? Then we're going to have a coin toss, just like we'd have any coin toss. Um, we're going to flip it. We're going to let the visiting team call it, and they're going to get a choice of they want to play offense or defense or which end of the field, and the other team is going to get the remaining choice, and we're going to go play from the 10-yard line. If there's no penalties, it'll be from the 10-yard line. If there's penalties, it'll be either half the distance to the goal or somewhere behind the 10, depending on. And we'll just rotate that process till somebody wins the game. Everybody gets hey, an equal number of – it's not sudden death. Everybody gets a – each round, everybody gets the ball at least once. Yes. I, I know you've got one of these and I've got one of these, but just especially for any new guys, we've got our little thing that we keep in our pocket during our game where we write things down on, but we have a little cheat sheet. I don't know if that will focus or not. Yeah. But a bit. We, we have a few key things on there, including carryover penalties, what you doing an inadvertent whistle and untimed downs, just the things that can get confused real easy with people asking questions, but that's gold right there when you have that situation pop up in a game. Absolutely. Had it in a playoff game myself one time and saved our rear end because you study it. I mean, that stuff gets confusing and it's the field goal is this and tries that and touchdown something else. And in the heat of the moment, man, it, it sure is nice to see it black and white, just to be able to pull that out and look at it. So, yep, that's what I thought. Especially when you're in a huddle with a set with six other people and a couple of them disagree with you. <laughs> if you can show them, I look, I wrote it down before the game. Here it is. <laughs> then they'll, they'll go with you then. So. so we're getting in that time of year where the eyes are on us more than ever. Okay. Uh, games count for playoffs, game count for championships. We're approaching the playoffs. Um, a lot of news media, a lot of, God help us, social media. Um, but not a good time to make mistakes, okay? Everybody makes them, but this is this is a time when we need to be extra careful. And if we think we're messing up, we need to stop and ask, okay? We can stop and ask. I, <laughs> I heard somebody say the other day some officiating advice that I didn't think was really that good. Um, I get what they're trying to mean, but it, it struck me as odd to say this. But somebody said, if you're going to mess up, do it quickly. And I thought, no, I'd rather slow down and get it right. And especially then it hit me that that's the last thing Jesus said to Judas. So was do what you do, do it quickly. <laughs> so I don't know if that's ever good advice ever. Like, I don't <laughs> I think just because of that, we probably need to just slow down and think about what we're about to do, because if you do things quickly, you might end up. <laughs> on the wrong side of history. So we don't want to be there. Anything else about overtime? Overtimes, we haven't had much. Have we had an overtime game all year? There's going to be five of them this week. We're due now, I, just because I said it. Just because I said it. So my crew, we're going overtime Friday night. Just be ready. I don't know if y'all going to be glad or glad or everybody else is. I don't know who's going to be the happiest, either the people that are going with me or the people that are not going with me, because I get my second varsity game of the year this week, and I'm just a little bit fired up about it. And if I didn't have a, game, a junior high game tomorrow night, we'd probably have a four-hour online pregame. And if I didn't have to work Friday, we'd probably be in Ramburn at 12 o'clock. We'd probably be at the, <laughs> the 
lunchroom or somewhere down there at noon tomorrow for the pregame. But just because everybody's got to work, including myself, we'll get there at the usual time. But uh, we're going to have a good time. I hope. It's a plan anyway. Anybody got anything else? How about anything else off that quiz from the state or the quiz that I sent out? I don't even remember what the questions were on that one either. You have to remind me. Um, or anything else. We technically have about six minutes before it's even seven o'clock. So somebody come up with something. You get a pork chop down at Rammer tomorrow. Really? I mean, Friday, yeah. She said, I, okay, pork chop. We may get down there even earlier than we thought then, just to eat a pork chop. <laughs> I got to get Brett Wiggins off work early. How do I call, Brett? We got to go eat pork chops. I need to call your boss. And can I do something to help you get, get on out of there a little bit? Uh, not unless you can find about 14 people that um, you can train in two days to do my job. Nope. And several other people's jobs. Oh, well, too bad. We'll just, we'll have to <laughs> eat, we'll have to eat and talk then. We can do that. Hey, David, do you want to? Do you want to talk about that whole thing about having the wrong down on the box and when you can fix it? Yes, let's talk about that. That's good. That made the, my little local quiz, but we had a deal last week, and it wasn't – I mean, it's one of the things that can happen, okay? A little miscommunication, but we fixed it, and it brought up a question about when can you fix it. So we had a situation in a game last week where we – and I'll get this backwards, and it don't really matter the actual scenario, but it was supposed to be a lot – it was either a loss of down and – wasn't or was supposed to be what or something anyway had to do a loss of down play but anyway they ran a play let's just say one play doesn't matter how many plays it does a little bit but let's just say you ran one play with the wrong down box okay and then you realize it and you go hey wait a minute that's not right okay for whatever reason it's not right either you did a loss of down incorrectly or you did a automatic first down incorrectly or well no, you couldn't do that because that'd be a new series but if you had a loss of down incorrect or you just lost a down or something, okay, when can you fix it, all right? You can fix it before a new series is awarded. So as long as nobody has gotten first down, you can fix it, okay? I think the play was they had an ineligible man go downfield. They initially thought the one that went downfield caught yeah, it, that was it, which would have been illegal touching. So they did the loss of down, and two plays later, they realized that was not the person that caught it, and but instead of making them – punt on would have been third down they correctly changed it from fourth back to third because they did not have the loss of down and there's you can do that as long as nobody's gained first down or as long as a quarter has not ended so anytime the quarter ends we all write down the down and distance and we communicate that down distance clip placement all those things right and we need to make sure that everybody's in agreement on that, especially if we've had a penalty or something right there, right at the end of the quarter. If you've had, if you're just flowing through the game, then it's not usually not an issue. But if you've had a penalty to enforce or something like that, right there at the end of that quarter, before the referee holds the ball up, that signal, that holding the ball up, facing the press box, that means that we're done with this quarter, and that's it. Okay. Once you do that, you can't fix it, all right? You're declaring that quarter over, and you can't fix a down or clock or anything else. That's all in the past then. So if you mess up, mess one up, you can fix it as long as nobody's gained first down and the quarter hasn't ended. And the quarter doesn't end officially until the referee holds the ball up. So just because it went to zero before you caught it, you can still fix it as long as he hadn't held the ball up. That was a good one. Anything else? I got I got two. I got two real quick. These are quick ones. Okay, I got two minutes and two things. All right. So junior high game I was watching and a junior high game I was calling. Okay. We had both games, we had a lineman catch a forward pass behind line of scrimmage. All right. No, I'm sorry. Catch a pass. One of them was forward and one of them we decided was not. Okay. The one that was forward might have been maybe touched by the defense. So just a side note, 
if the defense touches a pass, then there is no ineligible downfield, there is no illegal touching, and there is no pass interference. All of those rules go out the window when the defense touches the ball first. Okay, so if you get a pass that's deflected in any kind of way, then whatever happens after that is going to be legal. Anybody can catch it, and there's no pass interference. We saw that JSU last night. We had a pass interference call that was correct, and then review showed that the ball was tipped before before the ball got there, so the pass interference was taken off, okay? Same thing would happen in our game, except we're not going to get to review it. We're going to have to try to see that before it happens. The second play I'm talking about is one we had in our game I was home. We're running back in some kind of desperation, basically threw the ball like basically straight up in the air, okay? And then a lineman ended up with it, catching it in the air. But that was probably not backwards, but at least not forward. And so, therefore, that's legal, okay? He can pitch it backwards or laterally or backwards to the uh, to an ineligible number. But you cannot pitch it forward to an eligible number. So two interesting plays just happen to be both in junior high games. And one, junior high is great for a lot of reasons. One is you can really, really work on your eye discipline, your skill, whatever little thing you're trying to work on, it's a great time to do it. And also you will see weird, crazy stuff that will make you think. And you will probably miss it because it's, it's some of that stuff they do is so unexpected that it's very difficult to – to think in, a, in the moment as to what in the world just happened. It's great. You see great things in junior high games that you can go home and look them up and learn from them. Okay, I've done that many, many times. I've seen the wildest things I've ever seen in junior high games. So. All right, since we broke out the Ohio State hat, I guess it's time to go. So nobody wants to look at that. So I guess we'll just end the meeting. But. Hey, David, do you want to ask everybody if there's anybody that was on with somebody else that's not going to show up on the attendance list? Yeah, I know Bill Green is with Mark Proper, as always. Anybody else got a buddy that they're watching with? Well, all right. Well, the meeting is officially adjourned, but if anybody wants to stay, it's not my birthday this week, so I don't have cake to eat, so I'll sit here and talk ball for a while if y'all want to. Um, but other than that, we'll we'll say it's done. But anybody wants to hang out, just hang out. I'll be here a little bit. So thank you all very much. Thank you all. If you ever need anything, just let me know. Quick text message, phone call, or email away. Thank you all. <laughs>
No. What will we do? You got to do an untimed down. Yeah. Yeah, because you're either going to have offset foul. penalties. You're either going to have offset and penalties, which is an untimed down, or you're going to do the whole clean hands. One, 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 out, one is declined, and the other one's not routine. And either yeah. way, then you can have an untimed down because they're going to have to accept one. So, ooh, that would be fun. But if you offset them, you're you're replaying the down with the other team having the ball. Yeah, yeah you're but ball it, to, it, you're giving the ball back to the to the original passing team. But if B gets the ball with clean hands, and then both the fouls are on the return, they're gonna have to. Man, that's that's a fun. If they're both, both against the passing team, then they can accept that and have an untimed down. Yeah, because but the foul happens on team, after yeah. the change of possession. After change, the one on each team, yeah. it's totally different. Yeah. So there's you one on each team. team, and B got it with after clean the, hands. They're going to get an untimed down with a football because they're going to decline A's penalty. And well, then A can decline B's penalty. No, then B could then A could decline theirs and get the ball back. That's what I mean. They, yep. Nobody's going to take the option of declining. They're just going to – it's going to get – unless they both decline and they agree to go to yeah. halftime. Yeah, if they both decline, yeah, they're going to have to The offense has – it's going to get the ball back. Because A's got to decline back. the – or B's got to de decline A's penalty to keep the ball. And then if A accepts that penalty, it's an untimed down. Well, if they both yeah. happen during the return, they don't necessarily have to decline to keep the ball. Right. You're right. You're right. You're right. I'm thinking of before the before the change. Yeah. So you're going to go to B first. You're going to go to to B first and say, "All right, you want to decline A's penalty, so you can keep the ball." He's going to say, "Of course I do." So you're going to decline it. And then you're going to go over to A and say, "All right, you want to accept this penalty?" And he's going to get untimed down, or you can decline it. We go to overtime. I mean, we go to halftime. Yeah. That's what he's going to want to do. Yeah. Yeah. He declined them both. That's still going to go. That's still going to get you to have to. I got that on my brain. We're going over time. <laughs> right now. I think that. So, um, yeah, that's how it would play out. So you're still going to end up at yeah. halftime because you're going to decline both of them. But don't make the announcement that you're offsetting them because you do that, then you got to replay an untimed time. You got to replay, yeah. Yep. yep. So they don't offset. They're just both declined. Declined. Yeah. And that's, that's, a, and that's what I did. That's and that's, that's the way I announced it on yeah, Friday night that's... was they both declined the penalties. Yeah. And um, we're you going to the halftime. We're going to halftime. Yep. If you got them on both teams, you don't don't say they're offset. Say, yeah. he held, it's declined, and he blocked in the back, and it's declined halftime. Yeah. Because if you say well, they, well, they were on, they were on, they were both on the same team, so it was, it was both yeah. on on them, and they both declined. So. Right. Yeah. Ooh, this is I what I do this. today. This is what I do to David when we talk about scenarios. I always tell him, "Okay, that's all fine, but what if this happens?" And then yeah, well, usually the you know, up down a rabbit hole. And the kids yeah. are like, I'll be, "I'm always like, I'll be back in a minute." And the kids are like, "Oh, it's football season. We're never worrying." <laughs> The students are always like, if nobody calls about football, I guess we'll get to have our test this week. And I'm like, well, you know, if they do, then we, you know, we'll just rock on. So. No, the test is still on Thursday. It's still on Thursday, yeah. They can, they can, they can uh, what is it, self-directed learning? Yeah, it's here. Y'all saw this problem. I got to go figure out whose ball it is. <laughs> I got to go figure out this problem. Y'all figure out this problem. I got my own problems. Y'all do something else. That's a good one. That's a good one. Interception on last play of the half. That's that's probably going to make the quiz next week because I my quiz next week was going to be on change of possessions, and I didn't think that's a good one. Last play of the no. half. Or last play. Of, last play well, of the half. It was last play of the half. Yeah. Last play of the half is better because you can literally get yourself out of a bind by getting a halftime team. A team can. Yeah. A coach can be like, yeah, let's go to halftime. Yeah. Change a quarter don't matter. It's still going. I mean. 
Yeah, I just wish we got film from JCA so I could see how what I need to improve on. Yeah, I never seen one from them. Not in a long, long time. A long time. They used to have huddle back when they were eleven. Man, they had huddle. Yeah. Uh, one of the one of the people before the game, um, uh, it's the guy that I think it's one of the assistant principals, but uh, he said they were if they can get the enrollment up in the next couple of years, they're going to try to get back to eleven man. Yeah, I'm sure that's what they would want to do. So, yeah. I mean, you know, I saw in the news this week where there were four teams who were joining AHSA from other, AI, yeah, from the AISA. Yeah, so I think yeah. I saw where two of the three schools that filed appeals got theirs approved. One of them being White Plains. Yeah, they're they're playing yeah. for the playoff spot this week and. Um, if everything that Pell City's put out about the reason, you know, they're an eligible player, I'm hoping they get theirs. Yeah, I, I kind of felt the same there. way after I read the situation. I felt a lot different than my, you know, they get a raw deal. Not, I'm not saying it's not warranted with their coach and his history, but 